Today on The Big Questions, is evidence undermining religions? Good to see you. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. We're back in South London at the Harris Academy in Peckham to debate one very big question. Does evidence undermine religion? Did Jesus exist? Or Moses? Or the prophet Muhammad? As archaeological and other evidence emerges from the dust of ages, the answers are not quite as clear as the Holy Scriptures would have you believe. Biblical scholars have long known the Scriptures aren't what they once were either, with some texts discarded, others mistranslated and many edited and revised several times. And then, of course, there is science, which has blown a huge hole through religious notions as to how the universe was created or how mankind <coughs> came into being and even how babies are made. So today we've assembled a glorious host of biblical scholars and scientists, philosophers, archaeologists, theologians, priests, rabbis, plus current and former believers from several faiths on both sides of these arguments, all in quest of the ultimate truth. And um, you can join us uh, too via Twitter or online. Just log on to bbc.co.uk slash thebigquestions where you'll find links to continue the discussion. And of course, we will be hearing from our lively South London audience as well. <laughs> So does evidence undermine uh, religion? Uh, metallurgist and author of Where Moses Stood, Robert Further. Robert, hello. Yes. Now, you believe that there is a huge amount of evidence uh, for Moses and for the exodus out of Egypt, the Israelites, and you believe you've actually discovered the mountain where the commandments were meant to have been handed down. Probably, yes. Exact mountain, in fact. Um, I've been exploring in Sinai for about four years and I came across this mountain and it fits all the parameters not just from a logical point of view but from a biblical point of view. There are about 10 or 12 discrete descriptions in the Bible which tells you that at that mountain there were going to be standing stones, 12 of them, there was going to be a tabernacle, there was going to be a copper snake, there was going to be a goddess statue. Hathor, in fact. And when you go to this mountain that I've located and identified, all those things that are in the Bible are there, mm. and they are quite unique to that mountain. Standing stones. Twelve standing stones, mm. a tabernacle. Not only, and this is a quite incredible fact, fact of it, that tabernacle has uh, been described in the Bible as linen with red and yellow. And lo and behold, when archaeologists, I mean, I didn't do the excav excavation of the tent material, they found red and yellow linen fabric, just as described in the Bible. Wow. And it still exists. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So the tent that housed the Ark of the Covenant is still with us, or parts of it. I like your language, by the way. Lo and behold. It's very <laughs> biblical. <laughs> Verily. Okay. <laughs> you, and you say unto me. Let me tell me about the Exodus as well, because <clears throat> is there any proper recording of the exodus of 600,000, well, men, and goodness only knows, over a million women and children. Uh, uh, is, there, is there, because it's a lot of people. Yes, now 600,005 men alone, which would, would have equated to about two and a half million people, is yeah. completely impossible. Yeah. I mean, the population of yeah. Egypt at that time was about three million, so that's absurd. But that's because there's a misunderstanding of the term degel, which is the unit that they used, and they called, they took that as uh, a thousand, and they end up with 605,000. If you take a much more sensible uh, size of that degel, you end up with about perhaps 30 to 40,000 okay. people coming out. And was it, uh, was it uh, chronicled by the Egyptians? Because they were pretty good at recording stuff. There is written evidence and scriptural evidence of Hebrews or Israelites in Egypt, in northern Egypt, near Ramses at the time in the, in the 13th century BC. Mm. Um, and so there is evidence at the Egyptian end, inscriptional and written evidence. There's archeological evidence coming through Sinai that the Israelites came through there, particularly at this mountain that I identify. Yeah. And there's archeological evidence in Canaan of an influx of about 60 to 70,000 people who settled, new immigrants settled in about 
1,200, okay. some 1,200, in the, in the hill country. So, Professor Francesca Stavrakopoulou, Hebrew Bible and Ancient Religion, Exeter University. Should we go home? It's amazing. Um, no, um, I think we'd be here all day, actually. But if we just take the main points, um, I really worry that you've been led on a bit of a merry dance. Um, <laughs> firstly, the biblical writers themselves don't even know which mountain it is. They disagree as to the name of the mountain, the location of the mountain, etc. So I'm amazed that within just four years you've managed to identify the exact mountain. Um, secondly, the tabernacle uh, is essentially a collapsible temple. Um, Yes, it's, it's made of cloth. It's a bit like a circus tent. And this is a very late idea within the biblical uh, accounts. So if there were any kind of material evidence, particularly, you know, in terms of linens that still survived yes, from the Bronze Age, I'd be incredibly well, surprised. Well, it's there um, and it's, it's in the... Thirdly, uh, there is no evidence, uh, archaeological evidence, for vast numbers of Israelites either in Egypt... No or leaving Egypt. I didn't say there were vast numbers. It's a much smaller you, number. Well, you said, no, I mean any more than 100 or 200 people. I think you refer to 30 or 40,000. Yes. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Well, um, and lastly... Yes, there is. Th th I'm afraid there's not. Um, well, trust me, I know quite a lot about you this. Will have, I'm afraid you will have right to reply in it in just Thank a moment. You. There <laughs> is circumstantial <laughs> evidence uh, for the Egyptians talking about various forced migrations of various working groups, migrant groups. Um, people moved around this area all the time. So we have some circumstantial evidence of various different migrant groups moving in and out of Egypt. But as for in the 12th century BCE, um, an influx of 30 to 40,000 Israelites coming into the land of Canaan, um, th there is no such incoming group. This is simply about the development of new technologies, including things like water systems, mm. new methods of, of terracing, agricultural land on the hill slopes. This is about people moving Robert. from within Syro-Palestine up into the hill country. I'm sorry, I'm afraid you've been overtaken by a flood of archaeological and textual information that has left you high and dry on the shores of the Red <laughs> Sea. <laughs> Just like Ramses in Ridley Scott's film, Exodus, Gods and Kings, there is sound, firm evidence. There is linen fabric in the Eretz Museum in, in Israel, which is flax woven and I'm not denying the existence of linen materials. Of... We have some examples of linen materials. And this but has I'm come so from sorry. that. I think this you've has had the come from that. Well, you're so sorry. sorry. <laughs> He's had the linen materials pulled over his eyes. I think he has. I, I feel have you cute. seen? Have you read Benno Ruff Rothenberg's work? I've heard of Benno Rothenberg's work. You've only heard of it. Let, yeah, yeah, Benno, I listen, my Benno time can't be with that. us today. Well, I'm sorry. Yes, doctor. I'm inclined to believe what. Francesca says, and of course, if what she says is true, then the biblical account is false. But even if what everything you said were true, the biblical account would still not be true, because of course, none of it is the slightest bit of evidence for the really important things. For instance, God's appearing to Moses oh, well, upon Mount uh, Sinai. All of that. this is completely immaterial to that. that. And for that, of course, we have huge Wait. and completely decisive evidence well, against that's, that's something different. I, I want to just explore something, because there's, there's, there's mythology and there's myth-making <clears> and, and, and also legends that are necessary for a people. Why was this? Do you believe, Francesca, why was this necessary for the Jewish people at the time to have this story and to believe this story and, and to pass this story down? The Exodus tradition is really important because what it seems to suggest is that a people who have been under constant foreign occupation, um, they've always been the little guy in this particular region um, in the ancient Near East and um, contemporary Middle East today, same area. It gives them a reason to believe that somehow despite being the underdog, that they can be liberated, rescued from their situation by liberating God, and that they can have their own land. So the majority of the texts that are written about the Exodus actually probably date from a period shortly after the period of the exiles. In other words, when a certain community based in and around Jerusalem in the 6th century BCE were exiled by the Neo-Babylonians to Egypt and to places in Mesopotamia. To write a backstory that basically says we will return to that land because hundreds and hundreds of years ago our ancestors were also slaves in Mesopotamia and Egypt and our ancestors were given this particular piece of land. It's an ideological, mythological foundation. About self-identity. Yeah, for yeah. identity. Uh, Robert, uh, right, quickly, then, uh, Rabbi Miriam, I'll be with mm -hmm. you in a second. <laughs> All right. it, it may have been written down later. But what do you do with the Menepta Stella? What do you do with an inscription at this mountain, which is in 
in Proto-Hebrew. How do you explain Proto -Hebrew? that? Proto-Hebrew? Yes. Goodness me. Sorry, um, I keep, you're obviously not aware of it. I'm, this is recent research. I'm a naturalist dealer, and there is some debate as to whether the reference to Israel, we don't know whether it refers to a it's group or people. It's clearly says Yisrael We in, don't know in whether it refers to We're not going to solve this one right now. No. No. Ladies and no. gentlemen, <laughs> we're not going to solve this one Sorry. right now. Let me, let me cut to the theological chase. Hmm. Does this matter if it's true or if it's not true for faith and for beliefs? and for fundamental truths, Rabbi? If I could stand at the foot of a mountain and know that that was the mountain, it would send shivers up my spine. Um, I'm not sure it would make me more Jewish than I am today. Uh, and if I was told absolutely concrete evidence that this was a backstory to understand my position in exile, um, to me, that's still a valid form of this is my identity, this is my people's identity, and the narrative that draws us together, that uh, gives us a framework and rituals, and even more important, understands either our position as we are strangers in the land and how to behave, or how do we identify and, uh, and support others who are strangers in our land because we were once strangers so in the, the land. So the metaphor is more important than the reality? The metaphor and the shared identity that it creates. Yes. Um, Dr. Radisha Antic, um, uh, from Newball College, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, Adventist, sorry, uh, <laughs> Research Centre. Now, you, you, believe, you believe in Noah's Ark, you believe in, uh, in, in Adam and Eve. We now know, though, that, you know, evolution is a scientific fact. It's not some conspiracy by scientists. Uh, Noah's Ark itself doesn't look that feasible when you look at the, the cubits, you know, the, the size of it, given there were polar bears and, and penguins and, and koala bears and insects and all, all sorts and some somebody's worked out as well lots of scientists actually worked out that given all those animals on there um the the methane from the dung <laughs> would have killed uh, many of the animals and also the wooden <coughs> boat itself would have been highly flammable and would have suffocated the animals so there are problems about this aren't there yes <clears throat> let me let me first come to the point which was made to make archaeology the measure of all truth is so wrong and it simply it does not stand any evidence. I still remember that, for example, for many years in the archaeological community, there were uh, serious archaeologists claiming that the walls of Jericho fell into the opposite direction of what the Bible describes. Only seven, eight years later came another archaeologist, and I've seen this myself, the drawings they were digging there mm. and so on and so on. Another lady from Canada, she came with completely opposite description that uh, the walls of Jericho fell exactly as the Bible describes. Yeah. So just to impose... Forget archaeologists. Okay, to impose atheistic perception on the biblical text, it would be like uh, imposing biblical or, or theistic understanding on some atheistic I, words. A completely different okay, what about, Noah's, let's, let's what about Noah's Ark, for example? Okay, yeah, let yeah. me come to your point, the, to your question. First of all, I believe that there is God. Mm -hmm. And if there is God, if there is such thing as, and he must be a great mathematician and a lover of beauty, because when we see the universe, we see the atheistic community, they have no answer how the universe cosmos came, came into existence. Not at all. They are telling us that something comes from nothing. This is an offense to the common sense. There are around, <laughs> around 200, 200, 200 constants in the universe. Like and if, let me. me finish, please. And if only, one, Adam, then you. Go on, if on. only one of these constants is, is changed, nothing would exist. Then how the life started? Dawkins are telling us pure, sheer chance. If, yeah, if, the if somebody, is they, let the outcome to we, the point. We evolved. Yes. No, no, but the they universe, start, you know, to, evolution to, is starting with DNA or RNA yeah, molecules. Yeah, yeah. So, so sheer chance. He says but, the physical laws have conspired. How the f physical laws are the mov movement yeah. of atoms. Yeah. How they can conspire. There must be an intelligence. So have you considered writing a paper on this and winning the Nobel Prize? Because this turns over. Seriously, sir. This turns over. To your, to your this, no, this is the point. Yes. This turns over. Uh, incredibly scientific knowledge and yes. you know if you get peer-reviewed papers on this yes you're laughing all the way to the back I know this but still <laughs> if there is God if to come back to your question now yeah if there is God 
then he speaks. And he speaks also in the Bible. Then your questions about Noah, so is uh, Adam. Because there are miracles all around us. Adam. Yes. I, I'm not talking, I'm not invoking anyone. I'm invoking this Adam here. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is no, I mean, how on earth do you explain something coming from nothing? There is no scientific explanation proper for the creation of the universe. Well, that's simply untrue. And it's unfortunate that you could, you could impose that in this discussion so, so forcefully. Because what science tries to do yeah? is to impose objectivity onto nature, on observation. And does it by, by looking at the way the, na the, the nature of the universe is, and then we test those assumptions. Science is, in many ways, the opposite of common sense. So when you said this is common sense, I felt great joy in my heart. <laughs> We're very, very bad at objective reality. If you stand on a beach and look at the horizon, it looks flat. The assumption for, for many people over, over the course of the last few thousand years, although not all, and the Greeks were very good at working this out, is that the Earth was flat. Now we know, now know that that is not true, and common sense says that it is. We are trying through the scientific method to make observations about the universe, test them, and come up with a model as to the nature of reality, and crucially that has to be objective, and that's the difference between science and science. superstition. Well, I, I, science. Can, I, can I just throw your point yes. in? Just, uh, what about the point about the perfect conditions for life, if any of those factors have moved by just a zillionth of a percent? Sure. Uh, if, if, I mean, what's the answer to that? Well, um, we don't know how life began on Earth. Of course Earth. you don't know. Could, could I but, but, well, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. But we have an incredibly good working model. Right? And science is always incorrect. It's always transitional. We are always trying to refine the nature of what we know through experimentation and through theory and through observation until we get towards a better truth. And we will never find the truth. Yes. But what you're saying is we can't know. No. Um, actually, we've got a really, really good understanding of the origin uh, of life. Uh, a, 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 a book a bit about which I wrote. We understand DNA. We understand RNA. We understand evolution. Do you really understand DNA? I, Please. Well, clearly, uh, Hamza, Hamza, you do. let oh, me yes. bring Hamza in. While we're on this, this particular point, it, sa it, it, it says in the Quran, of course, go out and seek guidance, seek knowledge. Yes. Uh, we've had, and probably yourself as well, Muslims who uh, have, you know, do not accept evolution, and many do not accept human uh, evolution or evolution sure. in general, and this is against everything that science tells us. Well, why, I, don't, yeah. why don't they seek this knowledge? Well, we do, and we have to, and this mm. is something that we teach all the time. What we have to understand, we have to have epistemic humility, right? I think it's a bit binary. We're sharing these human values, we all search for truth. This is the standard. There's no atheist versus theist here. The issue is, is that science is limited. If you look at the philosophy of science, look at Professor Elliot Sober, a philosopher of science, in his essay, Empiricism, he says... You can mention a million people. Just yeah, get, let, me, you know. let me make the point. Mm. The point is, is that scientists are limited to the observations they have at hand. So there can be a future observation that denies previous conclusions. It's in flux. This is the beauty of science. We love science. So the point here is, are you going to use science as a yardstick for absolute truth? No. No sincere scientist would say that because we're bound to change. We're limited human beings. One day we look at the horizon, we think it's flat. Next minute we learn about maths and we know it's round. So the point is, let's have epistemic do think, humility. Do you think one day we will come to the conclusion, or scientists will flip around and come to the conclusion that man was created exactly as he is now? Do you think that will happen one maybe, day? Maybe, maybe not. And if but that does, if, okay. It's if, irrelevant. If that were to yeah. be the it's case. It's not irrelevant. Let, 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 Adam? Me, no, no, it can't wait, 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 it's irrelevant. Why is it not it relevant? It cannot be irrelevant. It can't be irrelevant from a sort of philosophical point of view about objective truth and objective, sure. the nature of reality. And that's, that's almost an academic or intellectual dispute. It also can't be irrelevant because it is the basis of all living things. There's a phrase by, the, by, by a Russian, or incidentally Christian, um, biologist that nothing in biology makes sense except for in the light of evolution. Dobzhansky said that. And it is absolutely true. From a pragmatic point of view, it is so crucially true because it means that medicine is incomprehensible unless evolution is correct. It means you can't understand antibiotics or metabolism or how viruses no, no, work that's not true. or how no, HIV that's works. Not true. I'm sorry. If, if, if I, we study well, it, let, let finish. Yeah. Let finish. It, it is true. We are biological entities and our biology is based on evolution by natural selection. Hans, Hans, let me ask yeah, you a question sure. because it, it's, it, it's not a scientific scenario. You've got to sure. acknowledge it. That if God created man with his own hand, 
like that. But if you were there, if you had witnessed it, the creation uh, of, of man with sure. his own hand, what would we have seen? Well, what would we have observed? I'm going to be humble. I have no idea. Because but it's this is what, what I want to... What do you imagine we would have seen? Would we have seen a giant hand? No, or? of course not, because we, we don't seen? believe in an anthropomorphic But that's literal. It says, in the, it says in the Bible there's a hand well, there. Well, I'm, literalism. Not, I'm Muslim, I okay, believe in what? the Quran. And the Bible, but we believe the Bible has slightly would changed. Would all of a sudden right? a man as a man is now have appeared from nowhere? No, what we're saying is this. Let's do the science. It's very important so we could find out what's going on. We have to. The, the founder of the scientific method, according to a historian, David C. Limburg, was Ibn al-Haytham. He was a Muslim, a practicing yeah, yeah, Muslim. We, yeah. we don't have a problem. But the issue is this. Why are we imprisoned from an epistemic perspective? Why is it only science? Mm -hmm. What about philosophy, reason, mm -hmm. maths, logic, mm -hmm. other forms to truth? Because what we've done, we're presuming a scientism here, and scientism is limited. But let me just we say, I think... I think I mean, Professor, Professor Peter. Uh, this seems to be getting a long, bizarre debate. I mean, verily, verily... Join us next week. <laughs> <laughs> if you invited me. Verily, verily, I lo and behold some stones which were talked about in the Bible. So what? That shows nothing about the existence of a creator. And even if, even if you are foolish enough to think there must be a creator, <clears throat> it tells you nothing about whether he's a careless creator, an interested creator, 27 in number, somebody who likes a drink, or is concerned about humanity. I think the great mistake which is going on here is somehow thinking there should be evidence for these things. We've, because we've even if that. you think, even if you're going to refer to God as evidence, as some way of being the cause sure. of the universe, sure. it doesn't help you, you because you just move from one mystery to another mystery. Up Vince, two in a things. second, Arif, you've been dying to come yeah. in. Thanks. Um, I mean, I think, I think we, have, we have strayed a little bit off some of the, the topics. I mean, some of what Hamza said seemed to me to be platitudes, and some of it seemed to make no sense at all. But one thing that I did get was that it's correct to say that we, there are a lot of things that we don't know, and none of you know it any more than we do, but you give it some divine label, whereas we don't. Hmm. On the specific arguments, I mean, coming back to, 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 to your apparent refusal to understand any of the points that Adam was making, if we look at the specific argument concerning the so-called fine-tuning of the universe for life, that is to say, hmm. you know, the particular values of certain physical hmm. constants is so specific that had it been different by, say, one part hmm. in 10 to the power of 100 or something, there would have been no life in the universe. That's, that's the, the argument. That argument assumes that this dispensation would have been very unlikely to have arisen by chance. We have no reason whatever to think that. The only reason to think that something like that is unlikely is if we have some grounds for establishing some particular probability distribution in advance. The only way to establish such a distribution in advance is through repeated trials of universes being created. To date, excuse me, let me finish. To date, we have one universe that we've observed in which we observe it to have happened. Could one of you please give me some reason, sure. any reason, for thinking that there is a uniform rather than other probability distribution for those constants? Perhaps you'd like to, Reddy, sure. seeing as you raise the other. Yeah. If I can jump in. I mean, you take one of those constants, the explosive force of the Big Bang. If it's the slightest bit weaker, the universe collapses back in on itself almost immediately. If it's the slightest bit stronger, the universe just disperses into thin air. You don't get anything like the complexity that would be necessary for life. The way I see this argument from fine-tuning, and it's the one thing so far that we've actually agreed on, on both sides, that actually the parameters for life are incredibly narrow. It would be like showing up and seeing a game of cards, watching someone get a dozen royal flushes in a row, and then you know but that yeah, outcome. But did we not? Can I just ask Vince? Vince, can I ask you a question? Did randomness. we not? The possibility of science is that we evolved to be compatible with that fine tuning, and that's why we're here. Well, no, but the Rather example, than fine tuning yeah, being but Nikki, created. But Nikki, the example that I gave, mm. in terms of the explosive force of the Big Bang, yeah. if you just conceptualize it, it's the slightest bit stronger. It literally disperses into thin air. Okay, Vince, there's can nothing you, Vince, complex, Vince, 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 there's would, nothing you, complex yeah, at all. Perhaps, the slightest all, bit weaker, it actually just collapses back in on that's itself. That's all very interesting, but he hasn't answered the question. Can any of you give me a reason for thinking that the distribution yes, yes. of those constants was uniform? That, 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 no, that is exactly uh, right. Uh, no, wait, I'm, I'm, let me give you an example. So supposing that, for instance, the first person who examined a snowflake under a microscope looked at it and said, oh, look, it's a beautiful, perfect crystalline structure. Mm. Isn't this amazing? I must have a really special snowflake. What are the chances that a snowflake would have this particular structure? Because it's the first one he's seen. There's no reason whatever to think that the distribution of patterns in snowflakes is, is 
um, but is we uniform both, rather than the, the, the question that there is, could be lots of other types of possible universes that would not include life. Could be, on the hypothesis they, that God does not, be, on the hypothesis that God does not exist, they, they there's no be, reason to think that it would be likely that we okay. would get one. Okay. okay. I, I, I want to. I want to. I want to move. This is. Let's wait, please. No, nobody please. has answered my question. It'd be interesting if anybody could. Nobody has answered my question. We need. We need to move on, and if we get a chance, we'll come back to the question because it's a good one. And uh, it's, in, it's a very interesting one, but I want to move on to the situation of if this is true. Just say, and please answer this, yeah. uh, and, and maybe Radisha as well, just say that science is right about human evolution. Um, and don't quote people who say that it's not, because 98% of scientists, 99% I mean, say it is. Okay, also. okay. Just say that human evolution, say we, we do have common ancestors with sure. bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas. Uh, in recent, relative recent history, six million, eight million years. With that, and you came to realise that that was true, would that dent your faith one iota? No, because I, I know <laughs> that by the scientific method, evolution is the best that we have. I appreciate that. I haven't denied that. Who's saying is, who's denying this? Mm -hmm. It's not me. Even the Islamic Orthodox normative tradition says we accept the science to a certain limit, but we understand epistemologically, the weakness of science, because it doesn't answer everything. Okay, but it wouldn't dent your faith. Would it dent your faith? Not. Now, please answer the question. If you came to accept uh, if, if evolution uh, as scientists do, would it dent your faith? Of course it would. Would it? I, I, I applaud to science. I think the true science is never contrary to the, to the biblical truth. So, so no problem. If, if, if ever, if ever, there are enough evidences, but what, what... But so you would lose your faith in God? I would lose my faith in, in God, okay. yes. <laughs> if there are enough evidences, but there Whatever are no it strikes, it strikes me in that case... Adam, 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 you Adam, haven't spent Adam, a great deal of time... Wait, 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 Adam. It strikes me that you haven't spent a great deal of time engaging with the evidence. And when you said, for example... How do you oh, know that I have not... Because you said, <laughs> can you explain DNA? Well, yes. we know absolutely loads about DNA. We know how it works in the broadest sense and at a fine tuning. Now, just because Please. something is too complex for you to understand more doesn't mean that it's not help true. You. Be more, <laughs> more humble. What we know is very, very little. Very little. Let's get some audience in and then Lola I will every come to you. Every serious Lola, Lola I will come to you. I mean, some would say, good on you, that's absolutely, you know, that's, a, that's your truth and you believe that and you're true to the Bible. Other would say it's kind of maybe sad that your, your, your faith is built on what they might think is, is sad. You're better off not looking for evidence. Oh, Peter. I think, I think you'll find it much better if, as a religious believer, you didn't go around looking for evidence for God because we can keep on contradicting that and arguing about it. And rather, it should be seen as a way of looking at the world in which you might see the world with awe and wonder and think it's a gift from God. And that's his rather nice way of looking at it. Mm. The problem is how you actually then understand that no, God. It, it, is that a God who actually is concerned with loving not. humanity? I think evidences point towards the, the existence of God. And I can keep forever, but we don't have enough time. <laughs> yes. I'm sure that's We've true. We've got forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hands up. Gentleman in a blue shirt there. Let's get the microphone over to you. Hello. Yeah, I, I think what's being missed here, everybody's talking about evidence and being convinced by evidence or not convinced mm. by evidence. Uh, religious belief is, is just that, it's a matter of faith. Mm -hmm. um, one of the people talked about how science constantly is being refined. I think that science is also refining religion. Anybody who believes is really having their faith tested by evidence coming through. Doesn't mean that they're not believers. I they're believers in an ethos, they're believers in a tradition, and they're believers in a way of life. And it's deeper truths. Just... Deeper truths, which is what I want to come on to. Yeah, mm -hmm. gentlemen, uh, just along from you. Some religions, they don't believe in the deeper truth or evolution. You had Dr. Osama of the Quilliam Foundation. He received death threats when he said that he believed in evolution. Yeah. You have uh, fundamentalist Islamists, you know, who do not believe in the sciences. They take a literal interpretation of the Quran, and they believe it's the word of God and they're willing to act on it. Look what, what's happened in mm. Paris. Really? The you know, is the word and of all, God. all across the world, even in Pakistan. And you, you said, hello, good morning. Hi. How are you doing? What do you want to say? Um, well, the question is, does religion, uh, does evidence undermine religion? Now, we're missing a religion, which is the atheistic religion, right? So <laughs> my question to, because it, it is a belief system, it's, you know, there is no God. So <laughs> it's not a belief system. if, well, Ali, I'll, I'll pose the question and maybe you can answer why not. No. I like it when you ask each other questions. That's great. <laughs> yeah, go so, on. basically, my question is: If we are a, pro a product of a blind, naturalistic, mechanical process, 
then what reasons do we have to trust our mind? Because cockroaches are much better than us at surviving as human beings, right? Now, if rationality is purely due to survivability, then when was the last time that we saw a bunch of cockroaches sitting around discussing quantum mechanics over coffee, <laughs> right? We clearly have a higher cognitive faculty than um, certain animals do, and we have there a There's a higher... spectrum, though, as you would, you would guarantee... You well, would, you would... Yeah, I mean, look, we mm. would look at Andromeda Galaxy and try and work mm. out the sort of constants around there. Cats wouldn't do that. So how do atheists reconcile the fact that their belief system uh, dictates that they're a product of chance, yeah. which would mean that how could you trust your mind? Well, there is a spectrum I mean, of self-awareness right? and intelligence. That's, that's, that's well, all I'm I saying. A atheism, interesting. You, you were exercised by that. Why is he wrong, do you believe, to say that atheism being a belief system is a kind of religion? It's an absence of a belief system. So, it, it, by definition, it can't fall into the same category as, as having faith or having a religious framework with which you in which you live your life. You it isn't that isn't a belief system. It is the opposite of a belief system. Uh, Arif, uh, yeah, can I just say something? Can about I just about come back? Arif, Arif, yeah, what Adam said is absolutely yeah, right. Sure. It is indeed the absence of a belief system. I myself, if that's what atheism is, I myself am more than an atheist because I positively believe that there, there is, is no, God. no God, just as I believe that there are no that's fairies, system, no then. Father Christ. Christmas, and Elvis wasn't resurrected, because we everything. have the same amount of evidence for all of those claims, yeah. fairies, Father Christmas. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I finish, please? I mean, okay, finish. If okay, you let look, me finish, wait, I think you'll find you agree with me, sure. because the point is that, of course, if the question is how can people who think that explain how, for instance, human beings have so much knowledge that they do, there are perfectly good explanations. If you want to know how we can know about the Andromeda Galaxy, I can tell you how you know, telescopes work. If you want to know how we're so good at organising yes, society, but, but it's through a process of trial and error. But his point is that, his point is that if evolution, if evolution is, tell me if this is your point, if evolution is the sole guiding principle of human development, that is aimed at survival, not at truth. And if that's the case, then no, it sounds a bit I mean. like we get on the scale and we think it should tell us the time. Truth Why should we believe that our thoughts and our beliefs Yes, yeah, so well, let me go, wait, everybody, please. Let me go back to you and then uh, okay. we'll get another point I, from I you. Think, I think my point was missed out. Um, mm. Look, you can believe in evolution and believe in a creator. There's no contradiction between it. That, that wasn't my point. My point was purely from an, a mm. an atheistic paradigm, yeah. right? That there is no God, there is yeah. no intelligence behind this universe, right? Yeah. Assuming, say, Darwinian evolution is true, even though science is based on induction, it can be wrong. Assuming it's true, how can you trust your mind when your mind is a product of a blind evolutionary process which doesn't have an end? Goal. If the end goal is pure rationality, then we should have the same rationality. But the mind has evolved and survived for, for, for 200,000 sure, years. And, do we, and do you mean, no, 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 you're missing the main point, and no atheist here has actually answered that. So well, let me just. Oh, okay, okay, like, sorry, if you're on way. Okay, sorry, answer that point. Can I just answer? Of course, of course we can explain it because the search for truth, being looking for truth, is a very good means to surviving. The truth about what drug cures this disease is a very good way for prolonging our survival, and it's our atheistic science that you will rely on in order to prolong your lives by taking your drugs. Well, that's 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 allow me to come to Joe now, if I can. Thank you very much for that. Allow me to come to Joe now, with a cat, with that, if I can, Joe and Taylor, because uh, we can talk about this, but there is science and there is faith and there are deeper truths and there is something that's numinous and transcendent and underneath that, which, which, is, which is greater than any of the stuff, perhaps, that we're arguing about here. Do you believe that? I do. I, I, I find it kind of interesting the definition of God that is being thrown around the room mm. because obviously there are different concepts of what God is and it can be a very divisive concept um, which is a shame in a way because I think mm. that we have a real challenge right now as human beings to work out what we mean in the light of what we know from science. I love science. I love science documentaries. I just watch them all the time. I love what I can learn from evolution and, and physics. Um, I still do hang on to God language. I find it helpful for me, and a partly that's from what I grew up with in a Christian background. Um, but I think in terms of my own experience as well, um, it, it is a very powerful, meaningful force for me to use uh, a concept of God. Uh, but a God that inhabits everything that we know about the universe now to distant galaxies. Mm. Um, and I think one of the problems we have is not so much with, a, a, with God as... <laughs> I would like to define God. Is God um, good? Does God but, maybe but is this the kind same of as nature? small God. I think we have yeah. this, we bandy around concepts of God that are way too small and archaic and stuck in the past. Yeah. There's, a, there's a sense in which I 
in which I agree with Fence, that. Yeah. And I just say um, one of the types of evidence we haven't spoken about at all yet is, is a sort of relational type of evidence. And I believe I know that my wife loves me. I don't think I can give you sort of public evidence for that and put it in an impartial way on the table and argue about it the way we have been about some of this scientific evidence. But I still think it's based on fact. It's based on subtleties of our relationship, how she speaks to me, her tones, how she touches me, these sorts of things. And if Christianity yeah. is a relationship... Okay. Well, well, let me come to this, on, please. A, a let me move it on. I want, to, I want to, if I may, I want to, if I may, uh, talk, about, uh, talk about Jesus. And I'll bring you back in here. Of course, does it matter? I mean, there are scientific mistakes in the Bible and misconceptions in the Quran as well. Um, but does, that, does any of that matter? Does it matter that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad didn't know about genetic mutation and natural selection? Does it matter that Jesus didn't know that uh, the sun, we went around the, you know, the, the sun and so forth? Um, did, I mean, did Jesus exist? Uh... Probably. Come on. Possibly. Probably. Come on. Probably. <laughs> Probably a figure, a figure who was um, wandering around, uh, prophesying, performing um, various ritual acts. Uh, he was a, some kind of a ritual specialist. You might call him a magic man. Some people call him a shaman. Um, a figure like that probably existed. Um, was he the son of God? I don't think so. Did he think he was the son of God? I doubt he thought so. Did he say he was the son of God? According to some of the, the New Testament writers, he did, but these are texts that are written at least one, two, three generations after, after Jesus. But the best records we have. I wouldn't call them records. Let me let Francesca finish and then we'll, we'll But the fact, is, the fact is, even if he did, I mean, I'm not bothered about whether Jesus existed or not. Great if he did. Who cares if he didn't, from my perspective as a historian. Um, but even if he did exist, even if he was executed by the Romans, um, it's more about the social and religious responses to this particular man and his particular group of friends, his disciples, this very early Jewish movement. Um, that's more interesting to me as a historian than uh, some kind of vague idea of a truth. Truth is a very loaded, it's a value term, it's a very loaded label. We use it as opposed to falsehood falsity. Well, Whereas something, something awesome. like evidence or plausibility, um, historical reality, virgin, historical Virgin birth, for example. What about the virgin birth? Well, how, how many mentions are there of that? And well, we've only got two accounts in the New Testament about um, Jesus' birth and uh, his childhood um, in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. The earliest uh, writer, Christian writer, that we have in the New Testament, um, so supposedly the letters of Paul, St. Paul, he doesn't seem to know about a kind of virgin birth tradition. He doesn't know much about Jesus' human life Mark at all. Is Paul, Paul. <laughs> I want to bring oh, Vince in if I can. Because, <laughs> oh. Vince, the, the, uh, you two aren't going to ever, ever, ever agree until the end time. <laughs> Vince, um, resur the resurrection, this is key, isn't it? And there were, there, there were witnesses, weren't there? For me, it's key. Uh, if you really believe that Jesus rose from the dead, even going back to the beginning of our discussion, you look at how Jesus treated the Old Testament, and then you have a model for how you might treat the Old Testament. It's not because of archaeological data that I do or don't accept certain things in the Old Testament. But with the resurrection, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. I'll just give a bit of it. Um, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the first verses of that passage. It's written by Paul. Is there any evidence outside finish. of the Bible? Just let me finish. There is some. Let me just let me finish on this point. Um, in, that, in that passage, Scholars, many scholars have accepted it's a very early creed. Many who even disagree with the Christian faith date that to within the first couple of years mm. of Jesus' death. A hundred years ago, people would have answered this question by saying the resurrection was legendary development. One person told the next, that person told the next, it went down the line. By the time I got down there, we had a crazy story. You can't hold that anymore because we know from this text that many people, in the text it even says hundreds of people, were utterly convinced that they had spent time with Jesus after he was risen How from many? the dead. Look, a lot of people. Quite a lot of people, hundreds, mm. and there are accounts of appearances to individuals, yeah. to groups in different places, at different times, doing different things. The question is, how do you account for that? That's a question for everyone, not just for the Christian. Lots of people I think that's And also how it caught on so quickly. And how it caught, and, and how it caught mm. on so quickly. So Jesus' followers, mm. they thought he was going to be an earthly king. When Jesus died, that should have been end of movement. There was no reason for that movement to continue. All of a sudden, you have the eruption of the Christian movement. How did that come about? Something happened. Historically, this, we this can say like something big happened. Can the I Christian fills that gap 
with the resurrection. If that's not how you fill it, that's okay, but you have to fill it with something, and legendary development won't Francesca, do it. It's extraordinary, because what I find um, particularly difficult about Christian readings of the New Testament and other early Christian and Jewish texts that didn't make it into the New Testament for various reasons, what I find really difficult about those readings is this claim to exclusivity when it comes to the resurrection. Resurrection wasn't some kind of amazing new idea that just popped up in the time of Jesus. Um, this is built on a model in which all sorts of deities, half human, half divine beings, resurrected from the dead, some even three days later. This is a recycling of religion. This is just an ancient mythic not, trope. Not with, a text that's that, not with a text that's that early with a man performing the sort of miracles who made the claims about his life that, that Jesus would date within a couple of years uh, of Jesus. Can, can I, would, and many, most, and, and all would date it within uh, his, okay. generation. Can I delve, in his generation. Can, can, can I, I delve, well, please, I want to delve, go out to Rudisha and I'll, I will come back to you, uh, Robert, further. I want to delve into some of the other things in the New Testament, the healing, of course, because Radisha, this is a this is a fascinating area, and Jesus spent quite a lot of time um, taking uh, people who were in those, in the words of the New Testament, possessed by demons, didn't he? Yes. People who um, is that not, frankly and manifestly, a, a misunderstanding of mental health? Okay, Why, I, I, wait, the, okay let me put it yes. another way. Are the people now? these days, who are possessed by demons. Okay, I have to say a few words about... No, what? no, please, no, because please. I have to set the agenda. Okay, then... Are there people then. now... Yes. That's, that's my privilege. Yes. <laughs> are there people now who are, for example, possessed by demons, have to demand... I think, yes, there might be some, yes. But what's, what's a demon? Could you clarify what a demon is, but, please? Uh, y y if you don't let me speak, then I cannot explain. I'll let you speak. I'm listening. Yes, yes, I think, but, but this is, this is the, the whole story. You, you, what we are doing just, we are taking bits and pieces from the Bible, but we have to look at the reality. This is the question in philosophy. What is reality? What's a demon? And, and yes, the, there, in the Bible, the text, the, there is clear explanation. What are have demons? Have you seen somebody who's no, possessed I haven't by demons? No, I haven't mm -hmm. seen. But many people living during the whole history of humanity, and the Bible speaks about demons. Yes, there, we don't know anything, everything about this. But, but yes, some people had some experiences. And some of these experiences are uh, described in the Bible itself. How is that good enough? How is that good enough as evidence? So this is what bugs me about it. The, the level of scrutiny you seem to be applying to a text which people like Francesca understand as a historical document, but you seem to understand as being uh, inviolate, absolute perfect, perfect word No, word I don't of think, I don't okay, believe okay. that. So to be fair, there's some of the other But the level of scrutiny no, you first. apply to uh, the, the whole things, that, everything that we're talking about, the na what is a demon, where you say it describes some things about what a demon is, is in the Bible, and you say that demons still exist now, but you can't apply any sort of scrutiny which is acceptable in any academic sphere, in history, in archaeology, and particularly in science, where we hold ourselves up to a particularly high level of evidential basis. Yes, you can basis. apply. You can apply. Well, what is a demon? You can't tell me what a demon is. Uh, yes, but... Because the, demons some, don't exist. Some people had experiences throughout human history. If you... If you uh, of course, you may laugh, and this is up to you, but uh, there, there have been experiences throughout human history with some supernatural beings, whatever they are. No, they and haven't. I, okay, oh, yes, they, they have. Because they I think have. we need they to have. bring up... This, oh, is, very, this is your they, atheistic... Okay. Okay, you you, you apply your, your assumptions me, and pre right. presuppositions of atheism to all religious phenomena. And, of course, you, you, you are allowed to do this, but then it leads you nowhere. Well, perhaps, if, you, if you just... Okay. Did they have an understanding okay. of mental health yes. conditions, or did they just yes. think it was demons? That's what, that's of what course, there are plenty of health, yeah, mental right. conditions. There, there, is, there is a general argument that knew. I would like to see addressed, which, of course, covers the issues about resurrection, mm. as, well as, as well as Moses and demons and all of these other reports that we supposedly have concerning these events, which is, which is Hume's argument, which is decisive and straightforward, and the argument is as follows. Everybody agrees, including all religious people, that the vast majority of reports of miracles are made by people who are wrong and deluded. Christians believe that about Muhammad. All Islamists believe that about Jesus. Everybody else believes it about both of them. Okay? They all believe it about the 10,000 or so prophets of all of the other false religions, which everyone in this room agrees are false. So we all agree that the vast majority 
of reports of religion are made by people who I are deluded. I don't think Joan does believe the second, the second, the second claim... No, no, hang on. No, no, no hang on, you can't no, in a minute. No, because you the second part of the Vishnu, argument... I want to hear from Vishnu. After he's finished his the, point, we will that, have a chance. Therefore, in, this, in each particular case, we therefore have to ask each ourselves, which is more likely? There are no documented cases of resurrections. There are millions of documented cases of people who believe in, for instance, Elvis or these other people who they thought were resurrected. In this case, which is more likely, we'll just have to look at what's more frequent. Now, that's the Humean argument. Nobody has ever refuted David it. David Hume. Well, yeah. Perhaps somebody could tell me what's wrong with it. Sure. I mean, Hume, Hume defined a law of nature as something that could not be violated, and then he defined a miracle as a violation of the law how of nature. How did that figure in my argument? So the argument you, that I mentioned, you're how, saying where this did is, that come You're in? saying this is Hume's argument. If that's Hume's argument, he's just, just defined, said. he's just defined okay. a miracle. Address right what right I said. Right don't, protect, don't make up what Hume no, said. No, no, Address I'm, what I'm I'm I said. <laughs> Vishnu, welcome. Hare Krishna, not an Abrahamic faith. How are you finding this? All right, so there's quite angry stuff going on here, isn't there? The resurrection is something out of my sphere of expertise. I won't ask you about the resurrection. <laughs> I, won't ask you about how, yeah. I won't ask you about the Holy Trinity. I won't ask you about Mecca. Don't worry. I will ask you... Why not? Why don't you ask about Mecca? Why don't I ask about Mecca? Why, why, I, I, I'm going to time, you, frankly. I'm gonna time. I want to ask him about what he exactly? knows. Please. Please. Um, you say that your, your holy book, which is called, just remind us, the... Uh, the Vedas. Mm. You say that in there there are some extraordinary... Uh, prophecies almost about human beings. Tell us. So, firstly, my belief is that science and religion can go hand in hand. Um, the key point is that the Hindu philosophy, which is underpinned by the teachings of the Veda, when we look at the word Veda itself, it means conclusion of knowledge. And within these Vedic texts that were written 5,000 years ago, they make reference to concepts such as embryology, such as the structure of the universe, yeah. such as atomic structure. And when we actually observe these um, scientifically, when we look at, for example, the stages of embryonic development... Yeah. Yeah. Specifically human beings, what does it say about okay, human so beings? Within uh, human beings, what's described in the Vedic literature is that at this point in humanity is described as an age of quarrel and hypocrisy. We can see that in society people are living to excess. We can see that um, within society there's an obesity epidemic. We can see that there are so many issues with today's society. Now, the point that I wanted to make... And that, that, no, sorry, so the, the quarrels and to, hypocrisy were pr of... of yeah, so if I wanted Current to go, times were predicted. If I could just go back to the first point, which basically talks about how the Vedic literature emphasises the embryonic, embryonic developments, talks about the structure mm. of the universe. So all of these things are empirical scientific truths. So when we look at, let's say, the stages of fetal development, yeah. these have actually been documented in the scripture, which is 5,000 years old. So they actually emphasise the point at which the time the head is formed, yeah. the point at which the limbs are formed, the point at which kidneys secrete urine. And so if we can actually observe that scientifically, through empirical evidence, yeah. there's scripture that's 5,000 years I old. I take your point that about that. That inspires some faith. I take your point about that, but it's just what they said about humanity. These days will be a time of hypocrisy and quarrel. We can see that in the world around us. There's so much mm. uh, trouble, so much conflict in the world around us, and this is just a further prediction that's verified in Vedic scripture. Mm. I mean, the prediction that there's going to be trouble and conflict in the world is one that's very easy to get right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Robert, so then, but, but then, to, if I could uh, just oh, come back to that, I, if we could I, address strangely, the points around... Strangely enough, I want to support Francesca, because the earliest texts about Jesus are not as the time you've talked about. No, not no. the text, but the creed itself well, from 1 but, but Corinthians the 15 knowledge is dated to and very early, And you talk early, about Jesus said. as a healer, healer, and it's pretty certain that he was a member of the Essenes. No, the Essenes, <laughs> well, well, If you want to argue about that, we can argue about that. The Essenes were known as the therapeutai, healers. No, they were. And he was a member. <laughs> There's a gap in Jesus' life between 12 and 30. Mm. 18 years, no one knows anything about him. How is it that this person who founded a fantastic religion that spread all over the world was not doing anything for 18 years. Do we think these arguments really matter? Yes, 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 yes. Of course, trying to point out the of fact course, that the issue about uh, he faith, was that surely is a key point for the religious believers. The reason you don't hear anything about Jesus between the, year, the age of 12 and 30 is because he's ensconced at Qumran, as oh, an Essene, learning... Where are you getting so this? Do you, not, do you not think that perhaps... I'll the reason Francesca Stavro... Wait, 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 wait. wait. You, you said I'll something. You I'll you no, no, please, Robert, Robert, in the time available I, to us, because I've got other things and other people I need to bring quickly. in. No, 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 let me no, answer your you, question. You, you, I, I, think, I think the reason why we don't know very much about what happened between... 
to Jesus um, before the age of 30 is because people didn't get interested in Jesus until he was nonsense. kicking off in the nonsense. temple in Jerusalem nonsense. and causing why, a rebel until he, he was executed. Uh, why would he be quiet? That's why we have no, all no. these the stories is, that have been written about Joan, the gospel Joan, tradition. Joan, no, please, this is no, this is, this is, this is <laughs> no use. Joan. A plague on all your houses. Please. This is no use. Sorry. Joan, I'm, I'm you, are a, you are a mere Quaker. This must be awful I am, for you. I am a Quaker, <laughs> but I've also but, written a book on the Essenes. You know that... Well, let's hear if she knows. Sure when did they come out as mature, qualified Essenes, yes, well, able to go out? Age Robert, 30. Robert, I yellow would, card in a minute. <laughs> I would say the Essenes are a legal school, the Second Temple Judaism, who were quite different from what Jesus was on about. Um, living in community, dressing in white, separating themselves from wider society. Showing everything. Um, baptizing. Only with you a, even wrote about baptizing. Uh, yes. Let us speak, please. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very big topic, and I think it would take us away from the subject okay. that we're, we're discussing well, today. But it must be but, interesting for you, if I may say so, that uh, you're, 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 you're an un, you understand the origins of Christianity. You study it. You're an expert in it, and to hear that there is so much vexation about it. Yes, it's, it is. Uh, it's a sh um, amazing and a bit of a shame, but it's also very interesting, <laughs> yeah, you know, as yeah. a historian, I love uh, looking at the different evidence and yeah. thinking about why uh, the New Testament accounts were put together the way they were, what the meaning was for those early Christian communities, thinking about the, the mental technology they had at the time, thinking about angels and demons, they believed in that, so they framed things in that way, and Jesus himself did. He mm. thought there really were demons that occupied yeah. people and caused illness. But behind all that, I think there is something that's very meaningful mm. about those stories, and I really uh, find them inspirational. Uh, I think that the, the model of Jesus, his example, the way he critiqued those in power, mm. the way he looked to the poor, uh, the kinds of things that he promoted in terms of values, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, all of these things are really well, valuable for us today. Well, listen, no, but, 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 Rabbi, Rabbi Miriam, what, what Joan said, please, but no, please, no, no, I want to hear from Rabbi Miriam now. Oh, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Rabbi, Rabbi Miriam, what Joan said there, I think, will resonate with a lot of people Absolutely. watching, is that, you know, you can, you can say, well, that clearly didn't happen, that might not have happened, that makes no sense, but there are inspirational truths and deeper truths within. So I think some of my um, co-religionists are, are doing um, religion in general a real disservice because setting up our scriptures to be a history book or a science book is just going to relegate religion into mumbo jumbo and nonsense. <laughs> and I don't think it was ever intended to be that. Um, I think that those, that, that those words enable us to um, search for the big questions and to be able to look for those answers in the best way we can in our own time. Um, and that's when we turn to our historians and our scientists to answer those questions for us. Mm. But it gives us the platform with which to ask the questions. It also allows us to look out at society and say, how do we see this unjust world and do our bit to try and right those wrongs? It gives us a vocabulary to start a very difficult journey, it certainly doesn't give us the truth and the only answer and one fix solution. Lola, you're a former Seventh-day Adventist. What? I don't know if you knew each other, but there we are, <laughs> meet each other. Um, do you think people need to look at the scriptures and do an edit job on them? Um, I don't know whether um, the, the religious leaders will be prepared to edit the scriptures, and they should. They should. They should. Um, but would they be editing it um, with facts? For example, replacing Genesis, the account of um, the cosmology, how things came to be? What, what would they say about the story of Noah? Would they say, this is wrong. We have, this cannot be a God that would destroy Children, women, disabled people, mentally ill, that could not... God's wrath, yeah. Yeah, mm. that, that could not have angered God rationally because they didn't know, you know, children, mentally ill people, disabled... Didn't know they were God, doing wrong. No. Yeah, and then God wiped the entire human race and preserved a family of eight, knowing that this family of eight would be as bad 
are the ones who destroyed, would they, what message would come from that? When they look at Exodus, would they say, this God in the scripture is wrong, slavery is wrong, because what they teach us in what they taught us in Christianity is God is constant, it's omnipotent, and it was the same as yesterday, today, and forevermore. A constant, consistent God would not have sanctioned slavery, would not be so cruel to animals, would not subjugate women, would not disregard children, would not be genocidal. These are the things in the Bible. Okay. Just of course, depending on what sort of God. <laughs> You can edit it into a history book, but then it wouldn't be your scriptures. Leaving in the difficult bit is the challenge of religion and the debates but that we need to be having. Adam, please, Adam, I yeah. just wonder, at the end of it, I, uh, Lola, Lola puts it very well there, mm. and uh, I think, uh, you know, Joan and, and, and Miriam say really interesting things about the deeper truths, but the literalist approach, mm. with, with all, all respect to uh, Rhodesia, for example, um, is that harmful eccentricity, as some might put it, or, or do you think it's more pernicious than that? I do think it's pernicious, and I think it's, I think it's intellectually and theologically redundant as well. It is a denial of hundreds of years, thousands of years, of a really good system that we've carved out for finding out objective truth. I have no objection and no quarrel with what Miriam and what Joan says. If, if religion exists to think about how we are as humans and to ask us difficult questions about the nature of relationships and the nature of, of how we interact as humans, then great, all power to your elbow. If you think that a, a text written a, a couple of thousand years ago by some Palestinian goat herds is going to be an accurate version of the evidence of goat what herders, happened. Goat herders. Goat herders. Yeah. Yeah. You said goat herds, I was thinking. Goat herds, that's the Surely word. that's a miracle. Shepherds. <laughs> <laughs> if you're relying on that text, which we know from theologians and historians has changed over time and has no sense of objective reality in it. If you are using that as a basis for looking at the nature of the universe, this, then you're no, flawed no, no. from fact, the beginning. This, this, your this, level of scrutiny, this, your level yes. of evidence is all, nowhere near what, what historians or scientists apply. Vince, it's interesting though, because, I, I understand because what let, let me ask you this, let me make this point, because the, those who are, might be just termed fundamentalists or literalists, they, they uh, cherry pick science, don't they? Sure. And a lot of liberal religionists cherry pick the scriptures. They say, well, I don't like that bit. Sure. But I'll have that bit. Well, you need to kill the scriptures. Well, no, please, 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 please. please. Sure. Vince. No, I mean, are you, are you, are you, are you guilty of that? I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying. But you assume that God does not exist and then make certain assumptions about how we that should view correct. the scriptures. Now, someone, you know, one of my colleagues, Richard Swinburne, he's someone who I think is as committed to evidence as you are, okay? His book in 2003, The Resurrection of God Incarnate, I know you will vastly disagree with this, but he looks at the evidence in a probabilistic way. He likes to work with probability theory. He comes to the conclusion that it's 97% probable. Oh that the Christian God came. Now, 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 I don't expect, you to, I don't, I don't expect you to agree with that, but he is probably the most influential British philosopher of religion of the last two generations. No one can say he doesn't take evidence seriously. There are arguments on both sides of this debate, but you can come by the evidence to a conclusion strongly that God exists. And if that's Maybe the not. case, then a lot no, of your beliefs about I, scripture... I, 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 could I please make two yeah, points about... Could I, could no, I please make two minute. points? Yeah. So the first one about the, Swin, the Swinburne book is that Swinburne starts with absurd prior probabilities to that you. he plucks completely to out you. of the air and no, cannot be justified. But, but the more general, the more general point those. that I want to make, which goes back actually to some of the things that, that, that the grown-ups here, like, like, like Miriam and, and Adam, have been... That's been I mean, to I mean, people, people it? yes, yeah. it's, well, it's, meant to be, it's not meant to be polite. Um, <laughs> um, Very quickly, but, but appreciate, to get you, onto that appreciate issue, you clarifying. To get onto that issue is, is that the Bible does nothing better than can't be found elsewhere. Its physics is worse than Newton's, its spirituality is worse than Plato's, its ethics and spiritual is that worse than Shakespeare's? We can find that elsewhere. We can find the okay, philosophy. Okay, listen, listen, elsewhere. listen, listen. We've run out of time. We've run out of time. Well, time's up. We certainly sorted that out. We'll see you next week. Yeah.